Okay, so we're recording now, and I just want to welcome you all to our wonderful evening, Poetry as the Conservation of the Wild. My name is Michelle Maloney. I'm the co-founder and convener of the Australian Earth Laws Alliance, um, and it is really my great joy to have wonderful poets joining us this evening, generously sharing and their beautiful artworks with us this evening. I would like to acknowledge uh, the traditional country of the Turrbal and Yuggera peoples. I live in North Brisbane, which is the traditional lands of the uh, Turrbal people. And I'm actually really happy because my Banyo, um, Mighty Banyo, is actually the local Aboriginal word for ridge and the beautiful local Nudgee waterholes. Nudgee means black duck and another suburb, Nunda, means waterholes. So I live on a ridge near a waterhole of black ducks. Nudgee Nunda. But I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we all live, work and play and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded, always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And I would also like to um, acknowledge the ongoing impacts of colonisation and the work that I do with many Aboriginal and First Nations friends and colleagues with another sister organisation called Future Dreaming which is all about how we work together to build a really beautiful future for all of us. So what I'd like to do <clears throat> with your permission is do a very brief introduction to who the Australian Earth Laws Alliance is so that we can contextualize our arts program and um, <clears throat> excuse me, fully uh, integrate and introduce our wonderful poets this evening. So if all goes well, I'm going to share screen. Looks like it's working. You can see the AILA website so the Australian Earth Laws Alliance, that's our website there, if anyone's not familiar with our work and you're interested. Um, our little statement about who we are is here. We are a national not-for-profit whose mission is to increase the understanding and practical implementation of Earth-centred governance. And we're particularly interested in structural reform so that the underpinning governance structures of modern society can be shifted to be more sympathetic and supportive of the living world. For anyone who's interested, we have five core themes in our work. This is all on our website. And um, changing culture, helping particularly industrialized societies, including my own cultural um, peoples, uh, to better connect with the living world and to better connect with local place and care for country um, is one of the things that we work on. We have a really um, wonderful, diverse mix of work that we get up to. We have a people's tribunal, we work on on the ground restoration connection projects with people, rights of nature. We've also built the new economy network. Um, so we have a really wonderful web of work that we're involved in. This is a separate website to show you the Earth Arts program that AILA has created in the last few years. Um, and it's a beautiful place where those of us who are not um, trained as artists, but feel that we are creatives. I originally am a lawyer. Um, but we are using our earth art space to connect with all human creativity to help transform the way we live, work and play together. Um, and in that note, so this earth arts website tells you a bit about the earth arts program. Uh, and if Mary and Drew, James Lee are on this call tonight, I would like to acknowledge them as my um, delicious partners in crime in building our earth arts program. This year, the Voices of Nature is our program uh, that's been focusing on bringing the sounds of the living world together with school um, and performance art as well. So we're very, very excited. The virtual gallery that you can see zooming past you. Um, we had to make a whole bunch of changes to our work this year because of COVID. Um, we've been planning local events all around Australia um, with community and grassroots and others, artists coming together, but we had to hold on that. So our um, virtual gallery is a way for some folks to share their beautiful works. We also have a national exhibition here in Brisbane in two weeks in conjunction with our Earth Laws Conference. But it's um, the wonderful public lecture series that we put together to try to bring a little bit of our arts community um, out into the world. And if you can hear a dog howling happily, that's my dog saying hello to my husband who's just come home. So please forgive us. Um, I wanted to tell you with howling that the Voices of Nature public lecture series, um, we've already had a number of wonderful events and that's actually how our Poetry as the Conservation of the Wild event 
has come into um, wonderful selection of activities we've been up to. So without any further um, chit chat about Ayla, I would like to introduce our wonderful guest poets this evening. Um, so our evening is called Poetry as the Conservation of the Wild, part of our Voices of Nature uh, program. Um, and you'll see there's a full bio here for Mark Trednick and Brian Walters. Um, and I know that many of you are familiar with Mark's wonderful work. I'll read just the first bit of his bio for those who are unfamiliar with his work. Mark is an internationally acclaimed Australian poet. His qualifications include a law degree and an MBA, and his doctoral work concerned the role of literature, um, is concerned with the role of literature, lyric poetry, and nature writing in particular, in remaking the relationship with the land. So um, that's a really beautiful way to do work, I think. And Brian Walters, um, very grateful for Brian to be joining us as well. Brian is a Melbourne barrister and writer. He's the author of two poetry books um, and his latest book, Brink, is themed around climate change. And both are published by Make Books Australia. And I was instructed very gently that I should mention that, Make Books Australia, so. But look, without um, going on any further, what I'll do is stop sharing screen. And I will now um, ask, I think Brian is going to kick off for us this evening. Um, and just a quick housekeeping, someone has asked if we can turn the doorbell sound off as people enter the, the Zoom. I've never been able to find it, how to do that. So if anyone has a magic way, just pop that in the chat box and I'll work it out for you. Um, but in the meantime, again, if you could stay on mute, that would be lovely. I will too. Um, and we're going to aim for about an hour, hour and 15 of wonderful poetry from Brian and Mark. Um, and then we'll open up for some questions before we wrap up for the night. So. Thank you so much, everyone, and over to you, Brian. Thanks, Michelle, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, so we want to explore tonight uh, a little bit of what it is to um, uh, have poetry as a means of reconnecting us to the earth. Poetry won't remove carbon from the atmosphere and it won't put ice back in the ice caps. It won't solve global warming. And yet, if we are to solve global warming, we need poetry more than ever to help us connect back to the earth. Poetry is a way not only of celebrating the wild earth, but also finding its matching landscape in ourselves. In the northwest of the United States, there are extensive conifer forests. For the indigenous peoples of that area, before the advent of roads and rail and lumbermen, knowing how to relate to that vast wild place was a matter of life and death. So listen to this poem by David Wagoner. It's the advice of an indigenous elder to a young initiate about what to do when lost in the forest. Lost. Stand still. The trees ahead and the bushes beside you are not lost. Wherever you are is called here. And you must treat it as a powerful stranger. Must ask permission to know it and be known. The forest breathes. Listen. It answers, I have made this place around you. If you leave it, you may come back again saying, here. No two trees are the same to raven. No two branches are the same to wren. If what a tree or bush does is lost on you, you are surely lost. Stand still. The forest knows where you are. You must let it find you. Now I just want to read a poem by the US poet Mary Oliver, who unfortunately died last year. She's been a, a wonderful nature poet and, and possibly one of the leading poets in the US for many years. And this is perhaps her best known poem. 
wild geese. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert, repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. Now the great Australian poet of place today is Mark Tredick, who we're about to hear from. Um, I think I've read everything that Mark's written. His book, The Land's Wild Music, is built from his analysis of four great contemporary US nature writers. Um, for me, it was a wonderful experience to read it. Um, before I hand over to Mark, I, however, I'd like to read his poem, The Kingfisher. Back in 2011, I came across this poem when it was shortlisted for the Montreal Poetry Prize the world's richest prize for a single poem. I was immediately struck by it and have been com a committed fan of Mark's work ever since. The Kingfisher didn't win that year. It was edged out by another poem, also by Mark Tredinick. The Kingfisher. And so each bird throws the idea of herself ahead of herself up the river, a line of spiritual thought without a sinker, and flies after it, as if the actual could ever hope to reel the ideal in. But so it is that awareness of the azure kingfisher, a dark electricity, a plump, trim elegance of intent, reaches you on the riverbank that last warm Sunday of the fall split seconds before the bird, so that when she passes you at light speed, her name is already a bright blue phrase on your tongue, is already the unresolved cadence of your second self. So let me um, pass the baton across to you, Mark. You're on mute. I'll get myself unmuted really soon. You've muted me. <laughs> right. Right, yeah. Hey, um, we have nearly 80 people here. Isn't that fantastic? Mm. Um, I'm really uh, proud of you all and delighted to be in your company. I know a lot of you. So, hey, it's, it's lovely. There's a fellowship of us out there. Um, good to be in the same room. And it's lovely to be here with my uh, great friend, uh, Brian Walters, who's... Uh, be not only a fan, but a patron and um, supporter uh, of mine for a number of years now. I cherish your friendship, Brian, and uh, you are a model to all of us about living the kind of um, ecologically responsible lyrical existence that would help the earth. It strikes me as an absurd proposition, of course, that poetry can do anything about the, the kind of catastrophe that we confront the, the, um, the climate disaster that we confront, extinction uh, catastrophe that we're on the edge of. Um, nonetheless, it is the, very often the small work is the great work. And if we're to change the world, we have to change ourselves. And I know no better 
uh, art form or human accomplishment or practice than poetry for pulling off that, um, that function. There's something about what happens to us and to language when we ask more of language and when we steal it back from the narrow, shallow discourses to which it is so often shrilly put uh, and in the process disparaged. It struck me writing something this morning how um, the dominance, for example, of theoretical discourses in the academy participate also in the forgetting of the earth, um, which um, we've all contributed in many ways in our um, inadequate use of, uh, of language for two centuries now. Poetry is the antidote to that because one thing that marks poetry off is its refusal to speak in cliches, its refusal to tolerate Kant. Um, poetry from the beginning and all the cultures that I know about has found a place to make an account that's adequate of the world beyond the merely human, as well as the world that's deeply human. And deep down in there, there's a wildness that holds us both and there's, there's no boundary. So poetry can perform a kind of magic if we let it. And um, if it seems to me too, you know, we are arguably um, by definition, the languaging animals and language defines us and when our language is well we are well in the world when our language is ill we are ill in the world and the world is ill because we tend to find inadequate language for it for example i was down um, with my partner jody on the coast this time last week and i took a lovely walk by uh by the river cockrow uh, creek and i came into a reserve and it had a sign up that said it was uh, an asset protection zone. Now, if we're going to treat the earth with language like that and ourselves in that way, it's no wonder we're gonna get the kind of problems that we get. That amounts to what my friend and mentor Barry Lopez would call an exploitive regard for the rest of the world beyond ourselves. I'm not an asset and nor are any of you and nor is any, any of those places, it's disastrous. I wanted to start um, with a small poem of mine called Standing, and I'm just going to try to share my screen here because it's a fairly new uh, poem. If I can find this fast, there it is. Can you see a poem called Standing? Good. Um, I know it's part of the um, agenda or it's on the, 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 uh, the table with the association to consider the question of the standing or the personhood, the rights of the natural world. This poem plays with that idea, which is very rich and challenging to all of us, but it really contemplates um, the lessons as in the David, Wa David Wagoner poem that Brian shared with us that can be learned from uh, an apt regard for the non-humans in the environment. This concerns three rough barked apples or angophoras uh, down in the St. George's Basin, Gundangara country near where I live here. I'm at, I'm at uh, Bowral, I meant to say at the outset, standing. The way the trees, three rough barked apples, throw their shade across the grass through afternoon toward the salt marsh and the dark, bright water of the lake is how I'd like to dwell my days. There's the kind of trace I'd like to leave a shifting mark downstream of every weather, a sometime recollection of how one learned at last to stand in the light of the world. It's a poem about shadows, really, with a little joke about my name, of course, thrown in there, a shifting mark. So I guess I'm saying the poem recognizes that we're ephemeral that much that surrounds us will pass too, though if we're careful it might outlast us, but to find a way to accept the passage of time and one's mortality and the fact that most of the world was here first and will go on after us uh, seems to be a coming to terms and just for one bright dark moment I felt as though I understood and then the sun went behind the cloud and I didn't understand <laughs> anymore. So that's a little poem for the trees. Um, I wanted now to, just gonna give you three or four short things at the start and throw back to Brian. We might just chit chat a little bit um, and leave some time at the end for questions. Um, 
about writing process uh, too, as well as some ideas, but mostly we wanted to give the space over to poems themselves, because, you know, if it's true that that poetry is a magic and it uses language again to invoke and make prayer and participate in a lyric existence that's we're precluded from in the prose with which our daily lives are lived, then we should give a fair bit of the space over to the poem. So here's one. This is from uh, Jane Hirschfield. Um, this is a galley proof I have of her uh, new book. I, now some of you would know Jane Hirschfield. Uh, she is a great hero of our times, and I'm delighted to say I know her uh, personally, and this copy is hand signed to me, which feels like it's been given to me by a, a goddess. But this is a poem you might know too, um, which cries the trouble that we're in and celebrates uh, the beauty that it is nonetheless. Let them not say, let them not say, we did not see it, we saw. Let them not say, we did not hear it, we heard. Let them not say, they did not taste it, we ate, we trembled. Let them not say it was not spoken, not written. We spoke, we witnessed with voices and hands. Let them not say they did nothing. We did not enough. Let them say, as they must say, something. A kerosene beauty, it burned. Let them say we warmed ourselves by it, read by its light, praised and it burned. It's a prophetic poem. Very beautiful and lovely and tender and a warning and a challenge, but uh, very beautiful. Um, Jane Hirschfield lives on the west coast of uh, America and guess what's happening around her house at the moment? And guess what's happened, you know, several times in succession over the past few years, the kinds of fires, it's been on our news, right? Um, and I know that she had to fight fires the other day in Barry Lopez, who lives in what strikes me as one of the wetter parts of the world in uh, Oregon, had to be evacuated the other night too. So our prayers are with them. It's striking to have written that poem, uh, which I posted uh, during the bushfires that afflicted us here uh, back in our summer. And then to know that she's dealing with that real reality on the ground over there. I thought I would read a poem called Catching Fire, which um, I've misplaced, but it's right here somewhere in my, um, where is it? Brian, actually, you know what? Why don't I throw to you? <laughs> because I can't quite see what I did with my book. Um, would you mind? And I'll find Catching Fire. We, we thought we've got some, it's hard to keep birds out of Brian's poems and, and mine. Um, so uh, we've got a little sequence on birds. Catching Fire will fit well enough with that sequence when I can, uh, when I can turn it up here. But do you mind picking up the talking stick, Brian? Sure. Um, so this poem's called, it's one of my poems. It's called Black Swans. Um, the immediate uh, inspiration from this was seeing a, a huge flock of black swans on the Gippsland Lakes, that's Gunai, Kurnai country. And um, so here's the poem, Black Swans. Unforeseen by the wise, yet you are here. Feathers unruffled by the fuss and flap of your epiphany. Rara avis, confounding metaphors of what can't be. You are light in hundreds on the lake, a skein of antipodean lightning. Your unlooked for necks arcing and looping in braided adagio. The world is always more than we imagine. In the dreamy afternoon, your honking peels across lazy reaches, flushing out old world precepts and setting them in flight. So I'll hand back to Mark now. A lovely poem. It's such a lovely uh, poem, Brian. That's a beauty, you know, part of 
how poetry does its work is the musicality of language and you could hear it there right in the phrasing that Brian took such care over which seems apt for the the epiphany for the moment and for the birds a beautifully intelligent poem too playing as it does with uh, ideas uh, about what's normal and who gets to say what's normal. The idea, of course, that Brian's playing with there is the old, you know, if you studied any philosophy at university, they used to give you that old thing about, you know, um, all swans are white. I know he said all swans are black, all swans are white. This is a white bird, it must be a swan, you know, to kind of deal with that proposition. And it must have been a ter terrific shock to um, all of the the colonists to come to Australia and look and not find a white swan anywhere. They're all black. Yeah. <laughs> Which is quite delightful. Uh, the same thought um, spawned a poem from me called black swan moment. Cause as some of you might know that corporate kind of cliche was being bandied around the beginning of the, the coronavirus. Um, and it's such an import. It simply won't work here because it means this is a, an, an unaccountable, unanticipated event. But if you're at Sanctuary Point looking out at the St. George's, St. George's Basin, Erewhon Bay, um, every swan you see is black. So I wrote a, um, in the very much the same spirit as Brian's, I've got a sonnet here called Black Swan Moment, which I'll read to you. The proposition was all swans were white. A thesis, swans here, never got to swim, like these two, slitting the silver scrim of morning open to receive an early rain. Each moment, if you find your way to it, is unforeseen, improbable as this one, watched over by the only white thing here, the egret on the shore. What makes the moment mythic is that birds show up in it at all, inhabiting their black swan cool as if it were their everyday attire. Like you, imperfectly adapted love to what the way of things requires, your smile, the white that flashes when the moment flies. That one's for Jody Williams. Um, and I found my poem. <laughs> Uh, no, I don't know. Actually, what I'll do is I also wanted to, um, I don't want to do that in a moment too. Many, look, I, I, I might save that for later. I, I, many of you perhaps heard um, echoes in Brian's poem of a very famous poem about swans uh, by a Northern Irish poet. Anybody want to take any guesses who I mean? Yikes. Uh, no, good guess, no. fabulous guess, but no. <laughs> well done, um, Jenny. Hello. Yeah. Hi, Mark. Hi. Um, hi, Brian. Hi, Jenny. <laughs> Say hello to Sally for me. <laughs> hi, Will. Sally's there, I think. Hi, Sally. Um, Seamus Heaney, postscript. Oh, right. With you know, they're busy, their heads busy underwater, and all that kind of stuff. It's you have lovely echoes, Julie. You're about to say that, weren't you? Yep. <laughs> Because <laughs> we just shared it in masterclass the other day, um, twice. Such a beautiful um, poem. Their headstrong looking heads. I've always loved that line. But you know, he's playing with the whiteness and the you know the rough and ruffling. So uh, beautifully done. What was I going to say? Um, birds seem to me to be uh, such um, a gift to us. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It strikes me, and Brian's poem gets at it, I think, very often, that um, it offends me in a way when I'm teaching students or dealing with the world and people treat uh, with disdain as if it's something that is of no consequence, the fact uh, that the Angophoras are in bloom or that these trees do what they do. And I want to shake them and go, you don't have a right to disregard these things. This is the this is the world, and we're in it, and we're lodgers. Um, you know, as many of you would share the sentiment, and I and I get a bit cranky with my students about that sometimes. It's really just not good enough um, to not think that uh, paying attention to the world beyond the human is something that we must do. Just it's right, you know. It's uh, it's it's one of it's respectful. Um, 
And it seems to me that one's you know, life in this place is an incredible gift that doesn't last forever. And I feel a sense of obligation to give that gift back, like to return it in some way. And I tried playing the cello, but I could never get good enough at that. Um, I tried a few things and that didn't seem to be the way. Poetry was the one that was left that I seemed to be able to manage to do. And in a sense to poetry, not only for me, but for cultures for uh, millennia on the earth, poetry has always been a way of giving back the gift, I think, and many other things. It's been an act of um, geography. It's been an act of testing the world, um, asking about our place within it, finding our way, noting what, you know, what's there and giving thanks. We've got a little bit more to say about that. I was going to um, share the, the poem Catching Fire, which is a, um, a sonnet. Um, written for Judy Beveridge, and it, it appears uh, in my book, uh, Blue Ring Cantos, and some other places. Actually, this is a special request for Brian. I'm fond of this poem too. I guess what it, what it does, I happen to know that this poem has been used at funerals uh, and as a way of um, consoling. Uh, grief is a thing in Western culture we do especially badly. Um, the whole business of death, uh, taking life and celebrating life. We're very awkward about it. Uh, there's something perhaps in this poem uh, that's, that's getting at that uh, in the background. So I guess it speaks to the holiness uh, and mystery and edginess and beauty of a human relationship with the world uh, beyond the window, if I can put it that way. In this poem, I'm sitting at a desk I once had uh, in a cow shed I once wrote in uh, not far from where I still uh, am watching a kingfisher. Catching fire for Judy Beveridge. As kingfishers catch fire, dragonflies draw flame. Jared Manley Hopkins. Mid-afternoon I look up from my desk to see a kingfisher alight in the water poplar. For 10 blue minutes, she sits wrapped in her sacerdotal self, murder on her mind. And I watch her steal her own silent show, doing nothing immaculately among the silver leaves. Until, as if my eyes had pinned her, the instant they drop, she flies. The stillest bird in Christendom reaches escape velocity faster than I can find a pen. And I'd like to learn to sit so still and to disappear so well. My body become a famished thought. My mind become a world. Thanks. Thank you, folks. Um, I, wrote, I wrote the first 12 lines of that poem in um, about an hour and a half, and it took me two weeks to write the last two lines. That's how poetry goes sometimes. It doesn't sound too clunky now, does it? Sounds like I can't remember what all the others were, but there's a kind of prayerful recognition of, um, you know, the, the, the accomplishment of the, of, of the bird and also an acknowledgement of reciprocity. There's no way that bird was not aware of my presence and recognition. And that was sneaky. The moment I went to get a pen to write something down, bang, gone. Brian. Um. Wonderful poems, Mark. Thank you. Um, I, um, I I love the way you've done the two Kingfisher poems, which speak to each other so powerfully. I, um, I've been a bushwalker all my adult life, and uh, that has informed my poetry. We in the West live lives, and I guess it's a life that I can't imagine not living, but where we have electric light that takes away from us the diurnal rhythm of day and night. We can have our heating and cooling so we don't feel the seasons. And indeed, you can go to the supermarket and get any fruit or vegetable any time of the year. There aren't seasons in the way that traditionally people would have known. So when I go bushwalking, of course, I've got to find water. I've got to carry what I eat and uh, whatever shelter I have. And I have to go to sleep when it gets dark, get up when it's light. And that can help in connecting us back 
to the earth. For me, it's been very important. So this poem is about an experience, bushwalking, and it's called Navigation. So finally, the track runs out and we are delivered to no ridge, no valley with its slow redemptive stream. Instead, a crumpled tablecloth of timbered country through which we seek to pass and pitch our tent. And there's really nothing for it but to take our bearings, needle sharp to all around us, tacking through trees, the undergrowth spun by the westering sun into a glory of gold and green, in which, though the day was long, our packs are no burden, but buoyant on our backs, and under them we float from point to point, luminous and aligned, listening to the land, which is our journey's end. Before I hand back to Mark, um, I just want to say that whole thing of how we think about the earth and the language that we use. I mean, I'm a lawyer, and one of the things that we talk about is owning land. Ownership of land. Think about it. The thing that we, if we're lucky, will be buried in. Um, and we say we own it. It's a very modern concept to talk about owning land it, it, uh, throughout history. That has not been the way people have talked about their relationship to land. And I think it's a false thing. But we, I mean, I'm Sally and I are going through some real estate issues at the moment, planning to sell and buy and so on. So that's the paradigm that we have. But really, at best, we're trustees of the land. We're looking after it for others. But our language doesn't reflect that truth and it impoverishes our relationship with land. I'm going to hand back to Mark now. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for those uh, reflections. Um, that is a central uh, issue. I have a couple of, that's a beautiful poem too. Um, I'm going to read you two really short poems. There's a kind of, um, let me see if I've got this one actually here. There's a very short, that the one. That's the one there. Oops. We can see it. Is it called Still? Yep. All right. The funny thing is I can't, but if you can, that's good. I'll read it off the piece of paper. Um, this is, uh, my students would all know what kind of poem this is uh, called. In fact, I might have even shared this one. This is a, a three-lined Korean form called the Sijo. Um, and I learned about it only about four years ago, five years ago, when Dan Disney uh, commissioned a few of us to write C. Joe for a magazine of the same name, beautiful publication that he's got going. He's in South Korea and Seoul. Um, and uh, I've used them quite a bit since, and they're really lovely. They have a, they're like a, um, a haiku for people who want to go on a bit, like me. Um, they're kind of a good, they're long lined haiku. They've got, three lines of 15 syllables and there's meant to be a little uh caesura kind of a gap in the middle check them out they're lovely and they're for the same kind of purpose of they have a pastoral and a lyric purpose they are supposed to be really used to speak uh, of human emotion um in environment so there ought to be a season and there ought to be something a little bit reflective there can be a little bit of politics and in this one still there is a tiny bit of subtle politics at the end. Um, I wrote this poem just as the virus struck. So this is March uh, of this year. And uh, I'm, I'm reflecting on that in, in uh, the word didalic mightn't be easy at first for many of you to work out, but it's uh, it's an, the adjective of Daedalus. And we know that Daedalus was apart from being the father of Icarus and, uh, who grieved for overreaching, really. Uh, he was also uh, a maker of refined objects and um, super 
intricate. So it's a reference. I actually pulled the word, the adjective. I didn't know it existed until I read a um, Percy Shelley uh, poem, which used it. And I thought that's cool. So that's the only difficult word in here. Still, still the moon grown old falls and trails its passing on the water of the lake and still the crickets ring. The didalic world slows. How vain we were forgetting our animal selves. Night holds still. Still, the moon grown old falls and trails its passing on the water of the lake and still the crickets ring. The didalic world slows. How vain we were forgetting our animal selves. Night holds still. It's funny when I'm uh, teaching and I'll talk to, uh, I'll introduce the idea like, you know, that's a radical idea that Brian uh, gives us there to, to rethink our connection to land. The concept that we can't own it is deeply shocking to Australians. It's almost our primary virtue, isn't it? Like the sign of a good life is to be able to, you know, have a mortgage and, you know, and own land. Uh, and it substitutes, of course, for um, values that might have a lot more merit uh, in the world. Here's another small seizure. I won't bring this one up so I might just get that get my screen down because it's a bit dull. This is a seizure called the rest. So Jody and I spent some time this year down by Erewhon. Um, it's a beautiful country, a shallow basin of water called the St George's Basin in, in English. Um, and a number of poems came out of there earlier in the year. And this is another one. Um, Solitude. Solitude here by the lake with you, love, is a book of birds. If I name just one, whipbird, say, or two, black swan, heron, hear the rest. Hear the rest. Sixteen notes scored by oars in glass shallows. Solitude here by the lake with you, love, is a book of birds. If I name just one, whipbird, say, or two, black swan, heron, hear the rest, hear the rest. 16 notes scored by oars in glass shallows. Um, Here's the book of birds. This is, this is how to write poetry. Well, it's better to go outside and see the birds, but you've got to have this by, by you. This is one of the loveliest objects that I, I have. Solitude with you by the lake, love, was a book of birds. Hey, hey, Carol. There you go. I know. I wrote a piece on Graham Pizzi, such a beautiful man. Um, back in the day. And I was so, I so loved that, uh, you know, chance to, to meet him. Um, I have a I have a, a poem here called Catchments, uh, which is for a lawyer uh, for Brett Walker. Um, it was commissioned by uh, the Red Room. Brett, uh, who's done great work, um, I think many of you would know. He's a very senior Australian lawyer, um, more often in the High Court even than Brian Walters, I think. Um, yeah. <laughs> and you know, a royal commissioner into the Murray Darling and. He's been also the president or patron of uh, Red Room Poetry. And at a certain point he was leaving and they asked me if I'd write uh, a poem as a thank you, which was, a, it's a lovely thing to do. Um, I think these days if I weren't getting commissions, I'd almost be stopping writing because I'm so busy with everything else. But um, here's a poem. Um, and it's about the concept of catchment, about extinction, about um, stewardship of land and rivers. Uh, again, catchments. The years disperse like crabs across the mangrove flats. The evening rises like a tide and still you are the child who ran these banks and even then your soul was slow with worlds you'd later learn to walk. Although it sings a single note, each minute is a choir, each moment simple on the surface as a stream articulates inside itself a watershed Immaculate with otherwise and everywhere, it bears a contrapuntal silt, 10,000 selves, a mirror in a mirror, 
eternity at a glance. Two, it takes a poem to out the inner life of time. It takes a life or two to learn to make a line as fast, to cast a net as felt, as higher thought, the sort of scheme that these Corellas swim, 200 anxious Sufis, a double gyre above the river bend. A pair of eagles broke this storm, pulled this lyric panic, this panegyric up by wires from where it browsed the flats. And maybe beauty is the best repost to dread and moments ache to turn their pockets out and show their seams to those with woken hearts. And maybe the gang gang pruning the crown of the hawthorn flush with dusk is the best dressed garden hand you ever hoped to hire. And maybe nothing true was ever half as simple as it seemed. And this you've learned is land you neither catch nor keep in shallow time. No, to prosper here, you need a deeper speech, kin to catchment, close to country. It's fall, the seasons flock. Times come again to steep our minds in time, to soften our step and quicken our thought and swim our days like rivers. Thank you. That book is, poem is going in my next book, which is called uh, Walking Underwater, named for um, the poem of mine that maybe did take out the Montreal Brian, um, and I've never collected it. So it's about, it's about time. It's now a long time ago, but I've got a bunch of rivery kind of poems uh, in there, and that's, uh, that's one. Brian, back to you. Um, Mark, let me just ask about yeah. that poem. Would you call that a prophetic poem or is it celebratory or in fact is it both yeah never ask a question you don't know the answer to brian is uh, <laughs> the thing they teach barristers about i think um yeah it's both right i think it it sounded quite bardic to me even as i re read it you know there's a funny thing with um with reading and writing poetry. I love to read it actually, but I never feel as though I've read all of the poem. And that's the beautiful thing because you, you spend so much effort in poetry, getting it to have the music and the intellection and the um, relationship with place and the mystery and everything else that no single voice, even that voice that belongs to the person who wrote the poem will ever capture all of it, but it's got a prophetic, tone in it and it's got it's it is um asking us to do better quicken our thought etc um but and it's also got some jokes in it about the best dressed gardener and all that stuff so it's celebratory and i guess it moves between uh levity and gravity brian the gravity of the the moment and the the levity of well hey you know this is what we've got let's just see if we can make the best of this it may not be too late i i, I think one of the functions of Poetry, um, particularly in this time of global warming, is prophecy. And mm. um, prophecy, of course, in the rich sense of that word. And if we do that too much, no one will listen. Um, it, it has yeah. to be combined with a celebration of the world of, as well. Um, I'm about to read a poem that is about prophecy and it is about global warming, although it doesn't mention that, it doesn't mention the land, um, but that's what it's about. And it's called Cassandra. Now, there are several versions of the Cassandra story. She's traditionally the daughter of King Priam and Queen Hecuba of Troy. She was reputedly the second most beautiful woman in the world after Helen of Troy. Um, and the legend goes that Apollo fell in love with her and gave her the gift of prophecy. But when she refused him, he inflicted, inflicted the curse that no one would believe her. I do want to mention that um, this poem was uh, the inspiration for my friend Hugh Crosswhite's beautiful composition for piano and violin Cassandra, which premiered last year at the Melbourne Recital Centre when such things were possible. Uh, seems a long time ago now. Um, it's, it's in um, my book, 
book of poetry, my first book, um, Angels Like Laundry. Cassandra. It is already clear to me you will offer no credence when I say that though he was comely and powerful and full of grace, and though the ambrosia he plied me with fired my loins until his blandishments made me blush, I found on listening to my heart, I could not make love to a personage of gold and marble. My mother called me beautiful long ago, as if to jinx me with her dreams. She delighted in my curled red hair, my keen blue eyes, a striking figure in my father's court. And none dared argue when he boasted of me. But I grasped too high to one who cursed me when I spurned his love for mortal flesh and blood. Prophecy is madness. To see, to see, to see what no one wants to see. To point to what is hanging in the air, lost in plain view and hard to tell. The reality we realize step by step as we walk towards it until we inevitably fall. Or is the madness just that none will hear? I stood at the gates of Troy, feet firm on sun-warmed flagstones, and declaimed against the looming horse, my hair like sunset's fire, while all about were crying victory and hauling the monster in, dancing round the offering they thought delivered peace. They drank themselves to ecstasy and feasted as if tomorrow would never come, intoxicated and exulting. They fell to making wild love in every doorway and every square, while I went from one to another, pleading, whispering, exhorting, even shrieking, but they called me mad. They spat and cursed at me until I wept. No one would listen. None but me could see the defeat they'd ushered in. In the face of a lust for peace, my words fell mute and my mind wandered debauched streets, deranged. And when the Greeks leapt forth from that deceiving belly, ah, uh, again, you won't believe me when I say it gave no consolation to see those bleary Trojan eyes grow wide with terror as they beheld me at last and understood all. That's a cracker, Brian. <clears throat> but, um, and it's, it's true, we need to find the balance in the conversation we uh, have in all fields, including in poetry between, between sounding the, the warning and celebrating the beauty that remains i guess and um you know you can understand the young ones getting upset at us for in the first place mucking up their world and then um being miserable about it um when they've got to live in it and try and make it work so that's very beautiful it so understands um how it feels i guess to be to to be uh to understand and not to be understood brian did you have were you going to read something else yeah well i might um segue from prophecy to celebration and this is um a poem about color really and it's called prism satin bowerbirds eyeing their options peck the beady color from the sky clean their preen their plumage with it and arrange it in their bowers to attract the perfect mate Pebbles in myriad polished forms and hues esteem the things that grow and debate which green 
might best be hidden in their hearts. Tonight, sunset tries out golden landscapes in the air, magic places to explore if bowerbirds had time to fly so far. Meanwhile, the rivers take into themselves all the colours of the world, mould murmuring forms round rocks they've gathered deep below, and flow unstinting to an end they cannot see. Let's go across to you again now, Mark. Uh, where where are you there in in that poem? So I guess I'm I'm uh, looking at colours. I'm in I'm in wild places where there's bowerbirds yeah. and there's sunsets and there's a river and um, uh, it's the the relationship between the colours that is is drawing that poem together. And uh, the rivers, what brings it together at the end is the river that flows to an end it cannot see. And sometimes I think attuning ourselves to flow in that way yeah. would be just the way life should be lived. Yeah, beautiful. I have uh, written about rivers Think of a Langston Hughes line. I love that poem. As you go, I have seen rivers. I have seen rivers. He just says it's so beautiful. Um, a couple of poems here, celebratory and prophetic. The, the mix, actually, the, the play of uh, gravity and levity, lightness and dark, um, is a special trick, signature move of poetry, actually, in the best literature. And um, it's uh, necessary, I think, to its doing the work that we wanted to do, the kind of rewilding of the self and the conservation of the wild in the world. Um, this poem is called The Fire and the River and the City and the Bush. The Fire and the River and the City and the Bush. And I'll read uh, it and then I've got a couple of places to go quickly, Brian, with, uh, with birds. You'll recognize the setting here. This was, um, it's the Kangaroo River actually. And uh, the time is, I think it was, early December. So Sydney was already thick in smoke. And uh, it was that it was that time and thoughts about uh, the way that we'd irreparably changed the, the climate were in the air and the river when I found it with some little uh, people I don't see often enough that was seeing on this occasion um, was very, very low. Uh, so low, in fact, that um, because it's dammed downstream, it was now running back at the level the river was back in the day before they dammed it. But the trouble was you were now trying to kayak among um, the stumps of, uh, of trees, like the proverbial graveyard. A morning in the city is a couple of packs a day. The, a morning in the city is a couple of packs a day. Fires ring the big smoke. A habit heaven finds it hard as hell to break and clouds won't break and rain won't fall, but ash falls on dinner with your daughter on plain air. A consumptive bling on everything urbane. The air is an apocalypse, an afterlife of trees. Contemn the weather long enough and this is what you'll earn, the light, a sallow holiness of grief. Sunsets so over promise in a drought each day at six a fuchsia bauble decorates the west and the beauty daylight dies in makes a mockery of hope el nino's an affliction of the spirit and every climate crisis starts at home what's an empty bucket want is an empty bucket at the bottom of a well Drink the earth under the table and watch the rain forget to fall, the rivers how to fill, the fires to abate, the birds to breathe, but still life refuses to sputter or duty to cease. And so you walk from the train at midnight and the moon's a blood orange paired on a bench and who among you ate the other half? As if the car park were a fire ground, 
Leaves lie smoked and cured and curled and uncared for as you walk to the car. The spirits of small household gods flown and fallen here beneath your feet, your tired feet, the bodies of the children of Pompeii. Night in fire weather, nights in fire weather are so often like the sea, the days their wreck, all weak treading water in the pall, while forests fall and rare things fail. You find your way to the river at last, but when you find it, the river's hardly there at all. Still, with your children lucky in their company, you row. Sorry, I lost my spot there. You row, you paddle the downed stream, learning drought in hired boats, an obdurate idiom, all consonants, no vowels, you're asked to master in an afternoon when love itself takes lifetimes. Nothing's where it should be, but here you are. Were there no drought, three meters of the river wouldn't fill the city's baths and the river wouldn't run again so close to roughly where it used to run. Nothing seems to teach us how to leave it well enough alone. There should be river oaks you navigate, not stumps, and the waters should yield kingfishers, something more to feed their young. Your oars are barge poles and the river is a swamp, but two hours with your children are an ocean when time has been so deep in drought. This is a paradise you row, lost like the world, thriving on necessity because the futures run so dry. Later there are milkshakes and soon the day is done. At night the, the world burns on, its boat is beached, but love may come, and with love rain, and with rain rivers, and with the rivers brand new words to float the world. That's in uh, A Gathered Distance, I forgot to say. Um, my most recent book, Walking Underwater, is my um, next one, from which, Brian, if you'll forgive me, I just thought I'd read um, a poem which alludes to... Um, birds and both celebrates profoundly because this is a birthday poem it's a, a poem for an occasion the occasion was um jody's 50th birthday i think i can say that and the bird is concerned with the godwit one of the shorebirds that you might know about for its profound migratory uh, gift its capacity to fly sometimes up to nearly uh, nine or ten thousand kilometers uh, on the wing sometimes and they 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 spend for them uh home is a circuit or a half circuit of the earth and i think we could learn something from them about notions of time that were circular that were tidal uh they're under pressure of course because of course the places the shorebirds love to thrive are really good for putting factories down these days and spilling our sewage and building airports and those kind of uh things so they're at risk uh, these birds, these accomplished beings. Um, so this poem uh, is for Jody, and it's a celebration and a naming of um, birds. It's also a testament to her own uh, journey in her own way. But like like all of us, she she's come a long way to still be with us, present and beautiful as she is. Two quotes at the beginning: the shorebird. First one's from Raymond Chandler. She was small and delicately put together, but she looked durable. And then from Rumi, just to the two interesting bedfellows, my soul is from elsewhere. I'm sure of it. I mean to end up there. They don't make birds like this anymore. Dunlins, red knots, sandalings, terns, summers in Siberia, autumns in Shandong. The months of early southern summer growing round enough in King George's mouth to fly the planet north again in March. Winter's not a concept they hold with very long. Birds born in sarongs, sandaled and thonged, lithe and way too slight, you'd say, to carry their many lives' belongings so slightly on their backs around the years. Denizens of distance, citizens of the tide, turnstones, green shanks, stints and wimbrels, their homes a narrow corridor, 8,000 miles, 10,000 light years, long a threshold we blithely furnish these days for ourselves 
adepts of three elements, earth and water and air. They bear the fourth through every kind of gale and squall, a quiet fire burning low upon a hearth, which is their heart. And are they not, these wayfinders, the sort of free we swore to say? And is it not our lost, our own lost way they find? So I met a girl like that one day along a shore, and they don't make many girls the way they made this woman anymore. Eyes like the tundra, smile like the steppe, her heart a mountain passage, her soul a silken tent. Give her a bill. Some feathers, she's the godwit, you see. All a god can know, a divine comedian, wise with words the skies read up and down the beaches of the earth, mirth the freight she traffics high and low. Even without rising, she flies you Finnish islands, strung with ice and lanterns in your sleep. Her territory, I notice, has crept happily inland. The flyways now a great divide and country where the clocks run long and trees moan low and with ancient airs. A million miles of memory, it seems, will teach you how to hold each moment, dear. A landing harder than you'd meant will teach you how to give and giving freely all the hope you'd learned to keep, earn you love as sweet and sl as sleep and steady as the stars. There you go. Brian, would you forgive me if I read um, another poem? Because it's a really, really good one. And it's by my friend Brian Walters. Um, and it's about birds, um, I think, and other things. So uh, it's called Where Does It Go, Bird Song. Um, Julie Perrin mentioned this the other day, and I think it was already on our list, but thank you, Julie, for mentioning it, because it's a lovely poem. And it speaks, I think, to affection, as I think that last poem does. Um, too, but you know, in this case, for the birds themselves and everything they suggest, where does it go? But so, Brian, is this in Brink? It's still muted, but Sorry, I'm muted. Um, yeah. it is in Brink, and I'll just hold it up so exactly it's... what I hoped you'd do. Yeah, <laughs> it should be on television, really, too. Um, where does it go, bird song? Where does it go, bird song ringing in air? Does it soar for a while before falling to earth, lingering there to anoint the loam and bless the soil bound mosses and beetles? Surely it does not merely fade away. Chirruping swells up, chortling to the sky. Does it wrap buoyant bubbles round branches to hoist them upward, offering relief to limbs grown tired from years of holding high the weight of nests and dreams and drifting clouds? Perhaps it gathers at night far above sleeping earth to snuggle burbling under brooding wings, nestling to warm the weary. When did bird speech fluttering from gurgle to warble blossom into bird song? Carols set out across chasms of mind, spreading out to newer far off nests. Do songs fly swiftly ahead to herald the advent of music spinning paths of melody that bind the world as one? Flung out into, into the sky from tiny throats, bird song echoes back from hilltop and cliff, picks out sonar contours of earth and air to mark out our belonging. Then, across the firmament, lights up the fires of dawn. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Mark. Um, I thought I'd read uh, this poem which is going to be in the forthcoming Earth Arts Anthology, which Michelle may well tell us about. It's called, it's my poem and it's called Bonfire. It's a sonnet in form. The hearth round which our friends and family sat to stare into the glowing coals and swap our tales of how the world unfolds itself is now a place of torment where the fire flares up to burn the house and any who remain. The things we thought would bless us with the lights of progress merely cast us in the furnace. Where no phoenix hatches from the coals, no salamander flits among the red-tongued flames, 
No blessed ones with strange companions walk unbound. For in this fire, no bird nor beast can live and people flee or die. We've lit the bonfire of our vanities and don't know how to put it out. So, um, Mark, I'm just conscious of the time. Yeah. Um, should I do the poem prayer now? Yeah, I was, that's what I was, I was praying for, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> so this is also in Brink. Um, and I guess it comes from wanting to, um, wanting to have something positive within all the, within all the despair that global warming can induce. Prayer. Let sunshine rinse the golden chalice of the sky so it resounds with psalms poured out from earth. And in the cadence of those songs, may broken things unite with wholeness once again. Let breezes tune the composition of the clouds, arranging sacred robes to flow around the hills and sweep up into heady airs. So those in search of hope may find their inspiration once again. Let fire tales spice the heavens, so heights may brim with darting plumage and surprise with color those who flee and fret in dark. And let the caroling of magpies lift their hearts with hope of dawning. Let prodigal rain return and raise its graying head in absolution, drawing goodness up from green, so you, the earth, may bloom and fruit and grow until the end of time. Beautiful, Brian. Um, may not be known to people here that um, both Brian and I uh, have preachers in our DNA. <laughs> uh, my grandfather was a Methodist minister, and Brian, I think you had a, uh, a similar affliction. Yeah. Uh, evangelical Anglican in evangelical my case. Yeah. They're indistinguishable, really. Evangelical yeah. Anglicans and Methodists is pretty much, you know, give them a horse and some long hair, and they're Charles Wesley. That's, that's it, pretty much. <laughs> Uh, lovely kind of so you can hear that in there I also have a, a kind of I want to finish on a celebratory note so I'm I have I have a poem here called litany and elegy which is another red room poem um, yeah for you Julie um, this poem was a part of a project ongoing for red room uh, called extinction elegies and it's it's uh, spawned some very beautiful work uh, so far this was my contribution. Um, and I want to then close and we'll see if you've got some questions here. Um, uh, after that, I want to close with a poem called Gaude Amos Igitur. Um, and I can lead you all in song if you wish to, uh, to, to join in, uh, Michelle Maloney, especially. Um, it's a poem for Barry Lopez. This one is Litany and Elegy. Uh, this one's for the children. And you might notice, could you hear the rhythms in Brian's poems? We've had a bit of iambic pentameter going on in the last few of them. And um, uh, this one's iambic, but it's got, um, it's a six beat line. Litany and Elegy. Each tongue, it has been wisely said, speaks galaxies. And when a language dies, a world and all that has no other being elsewhere fails. A silence falls where there was song and where there was something known, no other lyric grasps. Every species is a world of sound, a solid form of silence said, a body of thought. And with each dialect drowned, each lexicon beached, the world that is a universe of all these knowing realms knows less. The living world grows less alive. And we, 
who cannot find a patch of ground we do not need to claim, a wildness we do not need to tame. Fall deeper alone, the thicker we crowd the biomes. The thinner we shave the ways there are of being on this earth. And thought that flew like shorebirds once around the globe, refusing a single idiom or tide, idols mean abstracted streets and lives off scraps the sated throw away. Our words are made of plastic now and end up in the sea, where stocks of wisdom overfished and toxic with cliche dwindle and cease. So what will there be left for us to say by way of remorse? What elegy, excuse or prayer when the sands along subtropic shores have grown so warm that no more male turtles hatch and make it to the sea? And who will we be, our language atrophied a little more when Norfolk parakeets run out of trees to roost and fledge? And what will we grasp anymore of sin when all the devils that we know have slipped the earth? And who will teach us desire? And who will teach desire grace or passion poise when nothing burns the forests of the night? And when the last savannah elephant has scattered all the bones, what will we recall of grief when our turn comes to let our dear ones grow? go and how will all the plastic that will never go extinct school the seas in sanctity what sense will awe begin to make when no blue whales swim the world around and will our minds remember how to slow our speeding chill when all the whale sharks have passed sea otter snow leopard curlew bee Divinity will be burlesque and joy will be a sham when all these body suffers of the floating, hungry, thrumming world have left. O oh, person of the forest, orangutan, who might be any one of us who came down once from boughs, teach us while there are still woods to be, how to be the woods, not just the trees. So that's a kind of, that references a lot of bird uh, animals uh, in danger, um, that poem. And here's, a, to close, is a, um, a kind of prayerful, celebratory acknowledgement of the difficulty that we're in. Barry Lopez, who many of you would know, I know he's an important writer to Brian, um, and uh, he's become a friend of mine, and he's a mentor and elder for all of us, I think, um, one of the pioneering Nature writers and one of the great writers of our time, uh, in my view, and a very uh, profoundly decent uh, person, lives where he's lived for 35, 40 years, I think, uh, up the Mackenzie River from Eugene, Oregon, in Douglas fir forests, which are thick with mosses and um, wildly wet to an Antipodean way of viewing the world. And I was there, Jody and I were there with Barry staying for a couple of nights um, at the end of our uh, tour of the US and Canada in February, where I was uh, spruiking a gathered distance and launching the Montreal Prize and um, escaping, as it turns out, um, the depredations of a virus that was about to spread everywhere we'd just been. But um, Barry's place was very wet with moss and so on. Barry Lopez, Becker, Lopez, L-O-P-E-Z, Arctic um, dreams. I just want to say, this is sort of most famous. Yeah. Uh, book. Yeah, Arctic dreams, Arctic dreams, and, and uh, horizons. Horizon. Yeah, horizons. The new book, and uh, an essayist, uh, and writer of um, um, allegories and myths. I suppose beautiful individual. Uh, Gaudi Amasigatul, because Barry Lopez has travelled to Australia a few times. He's actually written quite a bit about it in Horizon. Uh, and one year he was out for the Adelaide Writers' Festival and he mentioned to me when I was with him um, that uh, in, in the midst of being gloomy about, you know, the fires in Australia and, uh, you know, the state of uh, the world, for which he holds, it's got to be said, frankly, very little hope. Um, but nonetheless, 
uh, acts with love um, be, you know, on the other side of hope is love and he's a loving uh, person he teaches us that but he was reminded of a Russian choir who sang a version of the Gaudi Amos Sigatur, which means of course let us therefore rejoice kind of in a loose translation of the Latin it's part of the mass some of you would know that Gaudi Amos let us now rejoice therefore and um, so I wrote this poem as a thank you poem for the time we'd had with Barry and as a reference to that um, story about what else can we do? Despair is frankly not an option and it's not worthy of us. So regardless, we celebrate and try what we can and find what we can in the world. Um, just as a quick final note, this very wet place has now pretty much burned. It's unfathomable to me, but um, this town, um, Barry is in Finn, Finn Rock, just up river from uh, Eugene and he was evacuated the other night in fires. There've never been fires there. So it gives this poem a special resonance, but I want us to finish on an upbeat too. Uh, it's a logging area. There's a river, Mackenzie, that runs by quite loud, like a real river that, you know, runs hard with salmon in it and stuff. Uh, and it's a deep kind of valley. That's all I probably need to explain. The whole world composes itself here. Cedar's husband, first light, along the thin trail I take to the creek. Log trucks pass along the road beside the river, which makes the quiet fast again. The slow sun takes its time like a mourner over brimming hills to the east. Morning lights the distance before it moves in close. Moss slakes the firs with what the wrens decant while this lasts rejoice while this lasts rejoice thank you very much now um that was what brian and i uh planned we've got a few minutes left and i'm wondering uh michelle sent a note out there about questions should you have any uh i've yeah, our words made it One question that's popped up, and first, thank yeah. you so much, gentlemen. Thank you for a beautiful evening of poetry. I'm sure everyone who's um, with us has had a delightful dousing of uh, wonderful nature flow and words and such. Um, one question that was asked in a private note was actually, will you be able to provide a list of the poems that you've shared tonight so that people might be able to either look them up or if, I was going to say, if you wanted to provide me with actual copies of your poems. We can put them together onto our website and show them, but whatever proprietorial um, rights or whatever, whatever you would like to do, um, we're very happy to share or not share and tell people to go and buy the books, whatever you wish. Yeah, no, uh, well, Brian, what do you reckon? Well, obviously we want people to buy the books, but we actually, we're poets. We're happy for anybody to read yeah. poems any way they can. <laughs> Well, if you would like to put together um, copies of the poems that you read this evening, I can collect yeah. them and pop them onto a little feature page that will stay on our website um, with this recording. So yep, delighted. I'm, I'd be delighted by that. So wonderful asking. Um, and we'll mention the books that they're in or coming out in as well, just in case, you know, you should be absolutely to find your way there. Um, yeah. Thank but you yeah. So. If anyone else has other questions for, for either Brian or uh, Mark, please, um, you know, either jot something down or wave or just turn your, turn the mute off and your voice on and say, hello, questions. Can I just say, I'm getting some questions there about links to the books. Um, yeah. Brian, you can speak to this too. Check my website, folks, which is my, it's just marktrudenic.com. Did you um, want to write I, it into the chat, Mark? Yeah, I will, but and, if you can spell my name right, that's the critical that's thing. That's why I'm thinking you should write it. I was about to, but knowing me, I'd get it wrong arctrodenic.com and I've actually posted hello Gillian's dog I've just posted um uh I I've got up there I don't know maybe 50 or 60 of my poems uh too so you can actually a number of the ones I read I think might be up, up there um that's another place to go to find them plus you can see all the books that uh I've got in the world and click on links and get get hold of them. I've got, um, I read there a few poems from um, my next and then the, the book after that, which will be coming, uh, I've got one out in December called Walking Underwater and another one out called A Beginner's Guide. I thought I'd better get around to beginning. 
Um, that'll be out in 2021. Wonderful. Are there any other questions, folks? Um, just, I've just got a, a comment. Um, for, a, for a long time, I've, I've been finding that the same sorts of things are in popular culture and poetry, etc., comes out. The, the fact that human, human affection, human perception is in retreat. And it, 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 it seems, um, I, I know that the great Buddhist teacher about uh, ecology, etc. cetera, she, uh, she says that the, the greatest, um, uh, she, Joanna Macy, she, she talks yeah. about the, the, the worst thing that we can do is to give way to apathy, to not feel. And in, in many respects, poetry, it, it refines feeling. It makes feeling exquisite and excruciating. Greg, brilliantly said. Yeah. Thank you. Beautiful observation. Yeah. But because that, we're talking about aesthetic experience, and of course, the opposite of aesthetic is anesthetic. Ah, <laughs> right. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Very good. Yes. That's true. That gets, Greg, to the, the kind of offense that I feel when people feel they've got no obligation to have regard to a world beyond the, the digital or the commercial. And, and there's an oblivion there that's a ho horrible kind of prospect for mine. And uh, even though many of those practitioners are innocent in a sense, they don't know any better. They're just the victims of the culture they've grown up yes. uh, with in the West. Still, we need it needs to be shaken up and... Um, you know, poetry will, will, will do that. Climate change itself is going to do it probably, but um, yeah, absolutely. I couldn't say it any better than you did. And there were, Thank uh, you. And there was, well, sorry. I was no. just going to say there, there's another, there's another, a, a Canadian ecologist used another wonderful term for it, the extinction of experience, because oh, wow. pe people's expectations <laughs> are progressively lowered until they're, they think this is the, just the way things are. Mm. Thank you, Greg. Yeah. I'm just aware of time, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We promoted this for 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Um, so I wonder if there's no other uh, burning questions, Brian and Mark, did you want to close with any final comments, encouragements, statements, or haikus? Oh, thanks for asking, Brian. What about you? Yeah, I mean, from my point of view, I, I wanted to encourage people to use poetry to keep them um, emotionally engaged with with the world, with nature, with the wild. And if we do that, we're shifting our culture a little closer to where it will need to be if we are to confront global warming. Well said, Brian. And it's in it's in the making, but also in the reading. Um, right. You know, we need a kind of revolution that. Um, has people read again, um, as you know, what once we did. My experience of reading poetry is that I feel enlarged. I feel again as if I belong in this very thing, the presence of which is denied by most of the Western discourses. You know, it's just your your back um, in a mind that's much larger than your own. And um, there's a way of being there that hasn't ceased to be, but we need to find a way back. And uh, it's magic, you know, po poetics and other art forms too, but we're here to celebrate poetry particularly tonight. Um, so I'd, I'd applaud what you say there, Brian, obviously, and we're not just promoting our uh, our books, of course, we mean the whole world of, uh, of poetry. And um, there are cultures still that inhabit uh, and live out a lyric way of being, uh, Celtic cultures, Farsi speaking uh, cultures, for example, indigenous cultures uh, and, and many. And what we're talking about, the, the, the crisis that we live within here in the West is absurd to such cultures. So there, there is a way we can find it again, but mm. some reading would help a lot. Mm. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, just to say uh, a simple closing remark about um, Brian mentioned that his uh, beautiful poem is in Earthwords and Artlings. It's Ayla's first creative writing and poetry and, and graphics um, anthology. And we're very grateful to Brian and many, many other contributors. And I think I saw Claudia on the call tonight. I want to put out a huge thank you to Claudia and Ali 
two amazing young women um, who've been volunteering their time to lead on the editorial side of, of this collection. Um, and perhaps the other thing I'll mention is do keep an eye on the Ayla Earth Arts um, webpage uh, for the upcoming events and activities around our Voices of Nature series. We will be having um, a Zoom connection for anyone who'd like to join us on Wednesday the 14th of October when we're at the opening night of our um, Voices of Nature art exhibition at Vacant Assembly in West End. If you are in Brisbane, do consider coming along and joining us. Um, there's a limit of 50 people. We'll all be enjoying ourselves in a socially distanced fashion, um, but we will have a damn fine night. And if anyone would like to connect with us, um, there's some of the info about the venue, the opening hours, and some of the beautiful artworks that the Earth Arts Collective and many other folks are involved in. So without further ado, thank you so much, everybody. A wonderful audience that um, many of you all know each other. So for me, it's been like an insight into a community of people who are out there keeping the spirit of the living world alive in their words and their joy. So it's been really terrific. Thank you so much, everyone. And a huge thank you again to Mark and to Brian for your time and for sharing your passion um, for words in the living world. So thank you so much, everybody. And we'll have a good, have a good night. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye, folks. <laughs>